Hey, good uh, day, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first webinar of 2017. Uh, in today's session, we'll hear how to make better drug discovery decisions through collaborative analytics. We'd like to thank Dr. Chris Cooper, Vice President of Chemistry with TB Alliance, and Dr. Matt Siegel, CEO of Optibrium, for joining us today. Thanks, gentlemen. To our audience, if you have questions that you'd like to pose to either Chris or Matt, please type them into the GoToWebinar questions panel. We'll be sure to address them a little later. Uh, I'd like to begin by asking Chris to introduce to our audience uh, TB Alliance and its mission. Happy to, Frank. Welcome, everyone. I think before I tell you about TB Alliance and, and what we're up to, I think it's important to set the stage by telling you a little bit about tuberculosis and where we stand in the global TB pandemic. So on our next slide, TB at this stage in 2017 is the leading infectious disease killer. It's a top 10 killer uh, of all diseases and all forms worldwide and is the leading infectious disease killer. On the second bullet, you'll note that Approximately 2 million people die each and every year from tuberculosis, and that works out to one death nearly every 20 seconds. There are over 10 million cases of TB diagnosed annually, and it's the leading killer of people with, with AIDS. And this is a huge problem when you're de developing new drugs to combat both TB and AIDS. Beyond drug-sensitive TB, we have the ever-present threat of drug resistance. This is um, well recognized in the infectious disease area. And TB drug resistance is on the rise with over half a million annual cases that could be multi-drug resist, multi resistant TB, MDR-TB, extensively drug resistant TB, XDR-TB, or totally drug resistant TB, TDR-TB. So this is a huge problem. And sadly, even in this day of modern medicine, approximately one million children will become ill with TB and resulting in uh, deaths of 20% of those children. So it's a, a very large problem indeed. And the problem really stems from the lack of sufficiently effective TB therapy. As shown in this slide, here are some of the issues facing TB sufferers globally. The drugs that are used are old. Most of the drugs that are used in the combinations for either drug-sensitive or drug-resistant tuberculosis date back to the 1950s and 1960s. The treatment itself is long. For drug-sensitive TB, you'll be taking medication for six months, four different drugs for six months each and every day. It gets worse with multidrug-resistant TB. You'll now be in a clinic or a hospital setting for 18 months. And for XDR-TB, you're looking at 30 months of treatment in a hospital or a clinic setting. As I mentioned, it's complex. For drug-sensitive TB, these are oral medicines, and they just have to be taken every day as you move toward drug-resistant TB, now you're looking at daily injections, as shown on this slide. And particularly for drug-resistant TB, these are expensive medications. They can cost greater than $10,000 per treatment for very long periods of time. And finally, for all of these reasons and more, it's an ina inadequate uh, treatment for, for the patients. And you can see, as shown here, because in part these are older agents, uh, patients stop taking their medicine this breeds resistance, breeds default, and as I mentioned before, with the comorbidity, comortality with AIDS, there's incompatibility with HIV treatments. And for drug-resistant TB, treatment often fails. On the next slide, so now let me tell you about TB Alliance. We're a not-for-profit organization. We're a product development partnership that was founded about 17 years ago. We have offices in New York. And we have clinicians, a small office in Pretoria, South Africa. And in one sense, we're going where large pharma has steered clear. They were involved back in the 1950s or so, but now there really is very few opportunities for organizations to develop new TB drugs, and that's what we're doing. We're a virtual business model. We're a virtual research and development model. We're trying to leverage a global pipeline of drugs for the most promising TB regimen. And that's an important point. We're not looking for a single TB agents. We're looking for combinations of agents. And we're hoping that through our efforts, we can ensure beneficial new TB regimens will be quickly and widely adopted. Finally, we're pleased that at this stage, we do have the largest TB drug pipeline in history. But having a drug pipeline is only part of the story. We have to move it through the clinical trials, et cetera. And that's really the, the effort that's ongoing. 
So our vision at one level is simple and complicated and, and maybe very difficult. We're looking to develop better tuberculosis medicines for all. So we are, this is TB Alliance's mission, we are discovering, developing, and hopefully delivering better and faster TB regimens. How are we going to do that? Well, we're looking to develop short, simple regimens that are adopted, available, and affordable for all in need. As shown on the second bullet, ideally, we would develop a universal regimen consisting of all novel drugs, so we'll have no cross-resistance with no cross resistance rather with TB agents that are in the marketplace and these would be effective for all people with active TB. And finally, as I mentioned early on, there's a huge unmet medical need for pediatric TB and we're looking to develop formulations for TB treatments that will be effective for children as well. And here's where we're going. At, at the moment, as I mentioned, current TB treatment is as depicted on the left side of this slide. Six to 30 months of a combination of multiple oral and injectable treatments, very bad side effect profile, uh, a lot of default as a function of, of these agents, not able to take care of the drug-resistant form of TB. We now, in TB Alliance, we now have regimens that are in the four to six month category, as shown in the middle of this slide. We're developing new combinations of agents in these combo studies that will hopefully bring that number six to 30 months down to three to six months. And our aspirational goal is could we consider treating TB like other infectious diseases in a matter of seven to 10 days as shown. And that's what we're about. Um, Chris, can you tell us uh, more about the day in the life of a distributed neglected disease collaboration? Really emphasizing how important modern technologies are for your work and why you chose CDD and Optibrium? Sure, I'd be happy to. We go to the next slide. I mentioned a moment ago about the largest TB drug pipeline in history. And while we're proud of that, obviously we want to continue to add more compounds, more agents, more regimens as shown in this slide. But more than focusing on the individual boxes at the top of this slide, let's take a look at the, the partners box. And if you start to look at the names here, you'll see that TB Alliance is working with a broad range of organizations, and these could be large pharma, small pharma, biotech, institutes, universities, all around the globe. Again, trying to identify and develop novel TB agents, both in the discovery and the development phase. These organizations, next slide please. So these organizations, as I mentioned, do in fact span the globe, and that's an excellent opportunity for us to tap into the research capabilities and development capabilities worldwide, but it does pose a challenge. If we go to the next slide. Now, you asked about what is a typical day in the life at TB Alliance. Let me at least tell you a little bit about a quote-unquote typical TB Alliance lead optimization project. It might start with medicinal chemistry, hit the lead, lead optimization, chemistry, analog synthesis, at a contract research organization, CRO number one. Those compounds might then be, and often are, sent to a separate facility for in vitro testing. This could be a university well displaced from where the CRO is. And here we're looking to see if we actually have biochemical activity on a given target. If we're fortunate enough to see activity in a biochemical setting, those compounds would be sent off to perhaps a separate research institute, where now we're looking at testing in a BSL-3 facility, which is also very rare. There aren't as many of those around the world. And we're looking at whole cell activity against mycobacterium tuberculosis. And finally, active compounds might be sent to yet another facility where we'll be looking at in vitro anatomy and tox testing to try to develop the right agents that are going to be useful for going into in vivo testing. And this cycle will continue, as we're all familiar with, developing the structure activity and structure liability relationships. And that's just four separate institutions or organizations. Compounds that fall out of this sphere that are uh, active enough to be considered for mouse testing might be tested in a mouse oral PK model. Perhaps that will be done at the same CRO. But if we actually see activity that we want and exposure that we like to see in the rodent model, we'll undoubtedly go to get another institution to do our in vivo proof of concept testing. And we'll look both at acute and again, on the next click, into chronic 
mouse testing. So all told, there's six separate organizations. And again, very often these are not nearby. These are in multiple time zones, et cetera, and requires quite a bit of coordination uh, across the globe. So we have multiple data sources. We have lab-to-lab -lab variability as well as site-to-site -site variability. We're going to be accumulating different types of data. And at the end of the day, we'll need to assimilate, integrate, and analyze the relevant data to hopefully improve decision making overall. So that's a typical day in the life. Sounds busy to me, Chris. Uh, we'd like to take a break for one moment uh, and uh, hear from our audience. So we've uh, designed a poll for, for you all to take a look at. And then we'll take a look at the informatics tools, namely CD Vault and Optibrium Stardrop, and <clears throat> explore how customers like Chris work with software partners. Charlie, could you show us? Hi. A so, yeah, we've heard Chris here uh, from the TB Alliance talk about the various collaborators and collaborations he works with and the challenges presented. So we wanted to ask the audience here, uh, what do you guys feel is the most important foundation for strong drug discovery collaborations? So if you guys could uh, take a, a moment to click your answer here, you can select just one. All right, we're getting some uh, great feedback here. I will close this poll in three, two, one. Thank you very much. So as we can see here, the results indicate that uh, the attendees feel communication and management is the most important foundation for making strong collaborations. Interesting. Thanks, Charlie. Kellen, before our feature topic with Matt, let's uh, you and I introduce a little bit of an overview of CD Vault, and I will begin with just a brief definition. CD Vault is a hosted database solution enabling discovery project scientists to manage all data with analysis and visualization tools enhanced by secure project sharing for fellow scientists and external collaborations in chemistry and biology. CDD offers a whole range of advantages to the user community who depend on our database solution for ease of use and affordability. CDD is built for teams with various domains, is powerful, and is ultra secure. Okay, so yeah, just a brief overview. Um, being a good central repository for collaborations means capturing and processing a wide range of assay data. CDD Vault enables users to easily define protocol definitions to capture raw data, generate normalized results, and even fit dose response curves. QC metrics are presented in a meaningful way so decisions can be made quickly before sharing with the project team. Users can also pull all accessible data into a customized search result table for SAR analysis. On the chemistry side, structures are captured as drawn, including relative stereochemistry notation. And physical chemical properties are automatically generated using JCHEM. Configurable batch fields can capture numbers, text, date, and even files for analytical results. Unique identifiers means every collaborating partner can locate resources easily. CD Vault's visualization tool is great for communication and allows researchers to filter data sets to a specific set of interesting compounds, organized into collections for further follow-up. Researchers can explore up to 16 variables simultaneously, from scatter plots or histograms, uh, which are both connected to a sidebar filter and a data table for details on demand. Plots can be exported for presentations and collections are saved to facilitate deeper discussions during lab meetings. The key for a collaborative system is to ensure new and experienced users can be productive quickly, capture their results, and extract meaning which can be shared easily. Thanks, Kellen. Remember that if you have questions to pose, please type them in the webinar questions panel. And now Matt Siegel. Matt, please, if you would introduce everyone here to Stardrop and your topic today, uh, it is all yours. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, well, it's been very interesting to hear from Chris uh, about the complexity and the challenges of, of diseases like tuberculosis and of the managing all the data that's being generated as part of these sort of multi-site global collaborations. And we've seen in CDD Vault how that provides a fantastic platform to sort of bring together data and share that across all the collaborators. But what we're going to focus on now is how we can actually 
use all of that data to drive good decisions in the context of a drug discovery project and, and target those, those elusive compounds with a high chance of success downstream and becoming a drug. So if we can go on to the first slide, this really illustrates a challenge which I'm sure many of you in the audience are familiar with, and that's this concept of multi-parameter optimization. Now, we know that a, a safe and efficacious drug that makes it to the patient population and cures the disease has a balance of many different properties. Obviously, we need potency against our therapeutic target, but as Chris has already mentioned, we also need appropriate chemical, ADME, and safety properties. They all need to come together in the same compound for it to be successful. And we also know that a typical project will start with a hit or early lead out there in sort of potency space, you can see in the top right-hand corner. Uh, but it's unlikely to have all the properties we need in this ultimately successful drug. And so we want to move as quickly as possible from that hit to that sort of sweet spot where all of these properties come together and we're most likely to find that high-quality lead, candidate, and ultimately a drug. On the other hand, as illustrated down below, we also want to illustrate those situations when that balance is not possible, essentially when the space that will give us potency does not overlap with all the other properties we require. And this is very commonly described, you know, fail fast, fail cheap. Don't waste time and effort making and testing compounds that won't succeed downstream. But that's an incredibly negative message. I mean, I've never met a project team that wants to fail. So we only want to fail when we're confident that that's the right decision to make. Essentially, when all of the data we generate can convince us beyond a reasonable doubt that we're in this scenario, at that point it makes sense to, to move on to the next chemistry or target or project. Because, of course, particularly in the case of these neglected diseases where there's a big unmet clinical need, the last thing we want to do is to miss an opportunity to find a good drug. So what we have is a very complex landscape here that brings some challenges. And the first is really illustrated here on this slide, and that is essentially data overload. We're measuring multiple properties uh, across many different chemistries and trying to find those high-quality compounds. And I guess if you look at the plot here on the right, we've got sort of three different parameters shown in the X, Y, and Z axis. We've got another shown by color and another shown by size. So that's five different parameters. And I guess, you know, it looks very pretty, but quite frankly, I have no idea how you would use a plot like this to actually find that, that elusive compound that meets all of our requirements in a successful drug. And on the left-hand side, you can see how a sort of a typical sort of traffic light plot, you know, where, where Green is good, it passes a criteria, red is bad, and it fails, and, and uh, uh, yellow represents a sort of a, a near miss, perhaps, uh, against all these different properties. And it would be fantastic if we had a green line that went all the way across and we had that perfect compound, but that's very, very rare. Um, and often we see a situation like this, and, and then we put a big question in our hands. It's, you know, uh, a red and a yellow worse than three yellows, or how do we actually decide on the trade-off between these different properties? And of course, that will also depend on how important each individual property is to that overall objective of our project. So we've got very complex data, um, and visualization is important, but you know, I don't think we, it, it's enough to solve this problem. And of course, it's even more complicated than this, because if we look at the next slide, we also need to remember that all of the data that we have in drug discovery has significant uncertainty. We don't know the values of these properties perfectly. As I'm sure you've all encountered, you know, all of the experimental measurements that we make have significant variability uh, and error. Um, so if we're looking early on in screening where we maybe have a, a single measurement per compound, uh, we might look at the assay variability, and I guess anecdotally, we expect that to be somewhere between 0.3 and 0.7 log units, or say an IC50 or, or a KI. That's a factor of two to five in that IC50 or KI value. And of course, we've all come across a situation you can see here in the top right where we move compounds forward, we get multiple replicates, um, and of course, they don't always give the same number. We have some distribution here, and so we might typically look at the mean, but that mean itself has a standard error, so there's a probability distribution, really, as shown by that sort of blue bell curve. And if we're working with predictions, uh, predictive models have significant statistical error. So if you look at sort of common things we might try to predict, something like log P has between 0.4 and 0.5 log units uncertainty. Solubility is a bit higher, 
And if we try to predict, say, activity against a target, then it's not unusual to see uncertainties of up to a log unit. That's a factor of 10 in a predicted KI or IC50. So there's a lot of uncertainty in those values. And not only is there uncertainty when we can use the model with confidence, but we also need to be aware of the so-called domain of applicability, or where a model has been trained to recognize chemistry, it can be used with confidence. And those uncertainties go up dramatically if we start to try to make predictions for compounds that are significantly different. So we have an incredibly complex landscape of chemistry and data and uncertainty. Well, I guess welcome to drug discovery. And so what we really need is a, a multi-parameter optimization approach that can take all of these into, a, into account. And what I'm going to talk briefly about here is a method that we call probabilistic scoring. And what this enables a project team to do, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner here, is to define the profile of properties that is required for their specific project objective. They can define what are the properties they're interested in, whether they be experimentally measured or calculated. They can define the criteria that they're looking to achieve for each of those properties. And also, they can define the importance of each individual criterion to the overall success of that project. Some things are critical. You know, we must have a potent compound, but there's no point going forward. For others, you can see towards the bottom of the list, we might be willing to compromise or trade off to do better in those critical factors. So having defined a profile that that sort of ideal requirements and the balance, the trade-off we're looking to make, you can then bring together all of that associated compound data, again, whether it's experimental or calculated, assess it against that overall profile, taking into account the uncertainty in the data, that experimental variability and statistical uncertainty. And what this does is it ranks the compounds by their likelihood of success. That is, the probability of achieving the ideal outcome that's defined by that profile on the left. And furthermore, not only can you rank a compound, but you can look at each individual compound and see the impact of each property on that chance of success. So here you can see this little histogram. Most of these bars are nice and high, but you can see there's a couple of low bars, the, the light blue and the pink bar are the lowest two. Those represent the biggest issues with that compound, and if you look at the key on the left, you can see that corresponds to the log P, the liquor felicity, and the Herg inhibition. So those are the factors we need to focus on to have the biggest impact on improving the chance of success of that compound. Now, if you want to know all of the details in the map and the sort of example applications of this, there's a, a reference at the bottom of this slide, uh, which goes into detail, but I thought that rather than go into lots of theory, it might be interesting to see sort of what this idea looks like in practice. So thank you, just handed me the control, so I'm just going to show my screen. And I'm going to show you what this looks like in our software called Stardrop. Um, so what we're going to do is, first of all, we'll start with some data. So before we go into Stardrop, I'm just going to jump across to look at CVD Vault. And I'm sure many of the audience are familiar with it, the ability to sort of uh, create searches across your data and bring back the data that's important to you and your project. And of course, those searches can be saved. And so if I just click there, you can see a list of some example searches in my vault here. And of course, you can run those very easily um, and generate a table of data uh, and associated structures. But if I go back into Stardrop, uh, we work very closely with our colleagues at CDD to create a link between Stardrop and CDD Vault. So if I choose here to run a search, what it's going to do is go into my vault, and it's going to give me the same list you just saw of saved searches that are relevant to my project. And I can just pick one here. In this case, this is some primary screening data against a, a target uh, neurokinin 2 in this case. If I click OK um, and just search the correct project, what it's going to do now is bring back that same data you would have seen from a live search within CVD Vault. So here what you can see, I brought back a data set with 191 compounds, and it has a name for each compound, uh, of course the structures. Um, here we have a label for the different series, and I'm just going to change that over to be a categorical label rather than simply text. And then the final column you can see here is that column of uh, screening data. So this is a PKI value against the target, which is neurokinin 2. And so I guess this is typical of a, maybe a hit-to-lead scenario. We have this primary screening data across a 
a wide range of chemical diversity. And what we're trying to do is find a, a good series, a high quality series we can take forward into lead optimization. Now we can start to look at some patterns in this. this. For example, if I plot the, uh, the activities of these compounds by series here, you can see this sort of scatter plot, or maybe I could look at a box plot like this, and you can immediately see here that uh, this uh, series in the middle, the amide oxenes, looks at least on average to have the highest uh, potency, the highest PKI value. Um, another thing we might want to do is actually to look at how this is distributed across that sort of structural diversity in this screening library. So what I'm going to do now instead is actually to create a different sort of plot. Um, I'm going to plot what we call a chemical state. I'm just going to break that out into a, a separate window here so we can look at it. And so what you can see here is that uh, each point in this lot, each compound in this library is represented by a point. Uh, if I point at one of them, you see the structure appears. And if you look at two points that are close together, you'll see that they are structurally uh, similar. Whereas if I look at two points that are far apart, you'll see that they're structurally diverse on the scale of this library. And one of the things I could do here, for example, is to plot that potency information uh, across this chemical space. So I'm going to plot that using color from the most active compound in yellow to the least active in red. I click OK, and it sort of lights up that sort of chemical space. Um, so we can immediately start to see some patterns. The, the bright yellow region down here is the, the most active. Uh, and we see that the red regions have the lowest activity, for example. Um, and we could, for example, look at that. Uh, and here's a, a histogram showing the distribution of the potency. And if I select the most potent compounds, then you see pretty much they all lie here in that bottom left-hand corner. So one strategy might be to take those compounds, uh, send them to the lab, get some physical chemical and anatomy data, and hopefully, just hopefully, find that the high-quality lead series we want to start with. But, of course, the whole point of my introduction is that the most potent compounds are not necessarily the best starting point. And so, at this stage, we don't have any experimental data for properties other than the activity. So what I'm just going to do now is switch over to this Models tab, and I'm going to calculate and estimate some of these other properties we're interested in. I'm just going to start that running. It'll take about 20 or 30 seconds. And I'm predicting things like the solubility, um, the liver felicity, the blood-brain barrier penetration, HERG inhibition, and so on. And so what we're going to be looking for are compounds that have a, a balance uh, of all these sort of different factors. That's just going to take a few seconds to run. I'll just tuck this window away and just show you now you see that problem of data overload. We have something like uh, 18 columns of data for all 191 compounds. And you know, the question is how we actually make sense of all this data quickly and efficiently. And of course, you know, one thing we can commonly do is uh, maybe plot some, some more complex plots. We could plot the activity against the solubility and the log p, generate the sort of nice 3D plot that we saw before, um, and start trying to sort of unpick that in a visual way. But as I mentioned, that has its, its limitations. And so instead, what I'm going to do is actually bring together those properties in one of these scoring profiles, as I showed you in my slide. So this is a, a profile that has been defined by the specific project team here. Uh, of course, any properties can be included, any criteria can be set. But in this case, the project team clearly wants an active compound at the top of the list here. Uh, they're looking for a PKI of greater than 7, so better than 100 nanomolar, but also soluble compound good human intestinal absorption for an orally dose compound, uh, the right range of log P, so not too high and not too low, and so on down this list. And of course, as I mentioned, potency is most important. You've got to have a potent compound. But for this project, in their opinion at least, the least important thing is the blood-brain barrier penetration. You see, in this case, they're looking to be outside of the brain, so low blood-brain barrier penetration. But in their opinion, uh, if they did get some brain penetration, that wasn't considered to be a significant risk of CNS side effects, so they gave it the lowest importance. Of course, you can define this as relevant for your project and your objectives. And once that's defined, you can simply run that to generate a score for each of these compounds. And if we sort that into descending order, you see the highest scoring compounds come to the top, 
and you have compounds that have what, 25, 30, almost 40% chance of success, and most of these bars are nice and high, and doing really, really well uh, against these objectives. So we can get this sort of overview and, and sort this list of compounds and data, but I'm just going to show you another way we can start to look at this data. Um, this is something we call card view. So what you can see here is that each compound is now represented by a little card, and I can choose some data to show on this card, so I'm just going to switch over to this, and you can see what I'm showing now for each compound, let me zoom in here a little bit, is a structure, um, that primary activity from the screen, um, and also the score against this multi-parameter profile. And these compounds are, are sorted so that the highest scoring compound is in the top left here, and as you scroll down this list, it gets lower and lower scoring down the list. And maybe we could do a little bit more here. Uh, let's put a little bit of color on this. So I'm going to color these by that primary activity. Again, the most active in yellow to the least active in red. And now we can start to see some interesting things. Um, for example, this is the highest scoring compound in the top left, but you can immediately see from the color it's not the most active. Um, in fact, we just looked down here, there's a, a much more active compound, a much more yellow card. So let's sort of see why. Let's, let's move these around. I can put these cards wherever I want, um, and I can zoom in here, and now we can start to compare between these. So again, from the color, you can see this is more active, and indeed the data shows it's about one and a half log units more active, but the score is lower. Uh, why is that? Again, the histogram gives us a little bit of a clue here. You see the, the light blue and the pink bars, and you see that key that's just popped up. That's the, the log P um, and the, the HERG inhibition. Um, and if we put here this sort of little circle, we go to sort of a second page, we can sort of drill down on this, and we can immediately see, yes, again, the data shows us that, uh, yeah, about uh, 0.8 of a log unit higher log P, which brings some additional risk. But particularly the issue here is, at least predicted at this stage, to be HERG inhibition, a very strong HERG inhibitor, uh, predicted to be at least, that's something we'd want to keep an eye on. Uh, so let's make a note of that. I'm just going to go to the page here and make a little note, possible ERG problem, um, just so I remember that, and, and maybe something we'd want to do is send that off to our CRO and, and either confirm or refute that with some experimental data. So this makes it very easy to prioritize compounds, compare between them, and understand what the issues might be. Um, but of course, at this stage of a project, we're not necessarily interested in finding one good compound. We're early on here. What we really want to do is to find uh, a series of compounds that we can take forward for further uh, analysis, further exploration. So rather than look at these compounds individually, what I'm going to do is stack up these cards by their series. I'm just going to stack by that series label. And what this does is it combines all these cards into stacks. Each stack here represents a series. And on top of the stack, it's showing some information. First of all, it's showing the, the substructure that is in common within this series, but it's also showing some, some data. So here, for example, if I zoom in, what you can see is this histogram here is showing me the distribution of that primary activity uh, in that series, whereas the box plot below is showing me the distribution of that overall score. So we can now start to compare between these series very, very easily. Uh, for example, you can see this, uh, this series here uh, is essentially dead. There's very poor activity. Um, the series to the right, here you can see a fantastic distribution of activity, lots of very active compounds, but actually the distribution of the score is pretty poor. So although I've got good activity, it looks like I'm probably going to run into some issues with those physical, chemical, and ADME properties. Whereas maybe if we look at this, uh, yeah, this stack right here to the right, the phenylperazine series, you can see a, a broader distribution of activity. But some of those very active compounds also have good scores. And so now you can see that not only can we access good activity, but appropriate physical, chemical, and ADME properties for our therapeutic indication. So that looks like a, a pretty good bet. Now we can start to combine these different views. So let me just uh, pop up that uh, chemical space again that we saw before. And um, so just to show you, of course, this is the very active series you can see from that stack of cards. If I click on that, yep, you can immediately see that's that, that hot spot we saw, the bright yellow compounds in the bottom left. 
on the other hand, if we look at this a little bit differently, maybe if I color this space now, not by the potency, but this overall project score, again, from the highest scoring in yellow, yellow to the lowest scoring in red, I click OK. Now you can see this area is quite red, but this now is our sort of hot spot, this little cluster of points here. And if I draw around those, then I guess, not surprisingly, it's that stack we saw before, that phenylpyperazine uh, series that looks to have that best balance of properties. So that might be where we'd want to sort of get some data to confirm that hypothesis. But just to finish off, I'm just going to come back to one point here, which is how sure are we? That question about uncertainty. I've brought together a lot of uncertain data. There's variability in the assay and statistical uncertainty, those predictions. So before I bet my project on that series, you know, how confident can I be that that's the right decision to make? I'm just going to show you one more plot before we finish. I'll tuck that chemical space down there for a second. And I'm just going to go back to the visualization tab and plot something we call a, a snake plot. Actually, let me uh, break that out and make it a bit bigger so you can see that on the screen. And just explain what you're seeing here. What we have in this plot are the compounds in this data set ordered by their scores. So the best compound is on the left to the worst on the right. And on the y-axis is the score itself. So as we saw before, the best compound has just under a 40% chance of success. But what you can also see around each of these points is an error bar. So once I bring together the uncertainty in all those individual uh, properties, the data that we have there, we have, of course, uncertainty in this overall score. And now what you can see is the error bar around this top scoring compound overlaps with maybe the top 30 compounds in this library. So if I tell a project, right, that's compound number one, go for it, you're going to look at that and say, just, just hang on a minute, we haven't got the evidence for that. Perhaps we need some, some more data, um, better error bars, higher resolution data, or another criteria to choose between these compounds. So if I draw around these, say, top 30 or so compounds here in the plot, they're selected, of course, here, but they're also selected in the chemical space. And now what you can see is, yes, it's picked that hot spot here. But it's also identified perhaps four other areas of this chemical space that, based on the data we have so far, we cannot confidently choose between. And indeed, if we look at the, uh, the um, stacks here in the uh, card view, you can see indeed yet most of those are in, in that phenylpyrazine series. But there are at least a few compounds in each of these other series which would be worth exploring. So a more rigorous approach might be to at least take small number of compounds in these other series, get some experimental data, which of course will have greater confidence in a prediction, the error bars will become smaller, and then we'll know for sure which of these areas will yield us that high quality lead series we can take forward into optimization. So that's just a, a quick view of sort of how this sort of approach for multi-parameter optimization can guide important decisions in the selection of compounds. Thanks, Matt. All right, so back to our little slideshow, and uh, I'll let you go to the next slide. Talk about core features. Yeah, fantastic. So just to tell you a couple of slides more about our Stardrop software. Um, as I mentioned, what we really focus on is the idea of guiding decisions, both in terms of selection of compounds, but also design, that next step in terms of getting new compounds with improved properties and improved chance of success. And we've already talked about some of these core features, of course, probabilistic scoring, this approach to that multi-parameter optimization challenge and targeting high-quality compounds, the question of chemical space and selection to the balance, a focus on quality with an appropriate exploration of diversity to avoid those missed opportunities. We've looked at some data visualization, including card view. Uh, what we haven't really touched on is that sort of more detailed SAR analysis, once we're looking within a chemical series, for example, and understanding the structure activity relationships that will guide further optimization. And then the next step I just mentioned is it's great to look at the data you have already, but really what you also want to know is where to go next and how to design that next compound. Um, so the idea of interactive design coupled with predictive modeling and something we call the glowing molecule you can see here at the top that sort of lights up the molecule and according to the SAR that's driving potency or, or any other properties. And Think about where to change that compound has the biggest impact on improving those properties and guiding the design of balanced compounds. And then 
On the next slide, you can see that this sort of core of Stardrop can be extended through a series of plug-in modules that add a comprehensive range of computational chemistry and chem informatics methods. And I'm not going to go all through through all of these today, but they include you know, QSAR modeling, both our own models, the ability to build your models with your own chemistry and data, predicting metabolism and toxicity, de novo design to help to explore new strategies for optimization, 3D SAR, including ligand and structure-based uh, three-dimensional structure activity relationships. So a real a comprehensive range of those capabilities you need to bring together in order to guide the progress of a project. And if you want to see more information, uh, you're very welcome to contact us. Um, and you'll see, just look on the next slide, uh, on our website, you can find detailed information and case studies. Uh, the publications, um, you've seen references at the bottoms of all of my slides, are all on our community site, uh, as well as some videos. And of course, you're very welcome to contact me if you'd like to learn more. So that's just a, a little bit of background uh, about our software in general. So having said that, um, I, to bring us back to the, the uh, first part of our presentation, I, I'd just like to ask Chris a question, really. Um, you know, you explained the complexity of the, the, sort of the, the, the therapeutics you're trying to develop uh, for TB. But you know, what is the sort of ideal product profile you're looking for? And, and I guess uh, in terms of the sort of in vitro assays that you mentioned, you know, what are those criteria that you're looking to achieve for those different in vitro endpoints? Sure, happy, happy to answer that, Matt. Uh, if, for us, the ideal product profile would have some and maybe not all of the following. We're looking, obviously, for very potent selective TB agents. So we look for uh, compounds initially that show very good biochemical response. Uh, we run those uh, biochemical assays, as I mentioned before, in one or more institutions, organizations. We then have to translate a biochemical readout to a mycobacterial readout. So we're looking for compounds that have single digit or submicromolar um, uh, MICs, so either MABA or LORA, um, inhibitory concentrations. So we're looking for in vitro response. We also need selectivity. We need to demonstrate that our compounds are acting against the mycobacterium, but not against eukaryotic systems. So we want to see a nice selectivity. We, we screen our compounds against a range of cell lines to ensure that we have a good SI or TI, a nice, a nice range between our cytotoxicity value and our in vitro biochemical and in, in vitro mycobacterial uh, value. Beyond that, we then get into more complicated issues, which have to do with uh, oral bioavailability, so aqueous solubility, um, half-life. Uh, we look at plasma protein binding. We look at um, herd liability. We want to limit that as well. I mentioned before as well that we're looking at a, a part of the population that has um, HIV, so we want to make sure that we have limited drug-drug interaction issues, so no cytochrome P450 liabilities. And then ultimately, we look at these combinations of agents in animals initially and then hopefully in the clinic so that we actually get a synergistic response between the agents that go into the regimen and we can actually then lead to a universal regimen uh, which has a much shorter treatment for humans, obviously. So it's a range of those properties that we're trying to manage all the way from the research end up through development, Matt. Wow. I guess that just illustrates how tricky it is to bring all that data together and, and how to how to make those decisions to get you quickly into the clinic. It's a challenge. <laughs> it really is. Matt, uh, in terms of your business, how do you work with academics and not-for-profit organizations? Yeah, I mean, that's a really important question. I mean, Stardrop is used by all shapes and sizes of organization, including you know, top 10 pharma companies, medium and small biotech. But, you know, we're, we're very proud of working with uh, many academics and not-for-profit groups. Uh, we understand the sort of limitations they have in resources, and we're very pleased to sort of support as much as we can the sort of important research they're doing, particularly in these sort of neglected diseases spaces. And I, I guess one illustration of that is uh, a consortium of global health organizations that we work very closely with. Um, that includes, uh, of course, TB Alliance, and we're very pleased to be working with Chris and his colleagues, but also organizations like Medicines for Malaria Venture, Drugs and Neglected Disease Initiative, and many of the individual institutes and uh, universities that they actually support 
in doing these uh, drug discovery projects. Very good. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Chris, uh, circling back to you, could you describe your current use of CDD Vault and Star Drop and what it all means to your science team? Yep, happy to, Frank. So uh, if we go to the next slide. Right. So I, I introduced this um, a little while back before we move on. I did want to reemphasize the fact that TB Alliance is a virtual R&D organization, about 48 individuals trying to do, as I just pointed out, just communicated to Matt, a lot of different things. If we were in a big pharma setting, uh, perhaps all the activities you see on this slide would be housed under one roof, or at least uh, within the complex of, of one organization. We're quite spread out across the globe. So we're doing a lot of different activities. Many of these should be familiar to drug hunters out there, but we're we're trying to gather all this information um, in an as efficient and cost-effective way as possible because, again, we're a not-for-profit organization, as I mentioned. And right at the outset, you know, as we started to look at the problem here, we broke it into two areas that we wanted to solve, and I'm very pleased with our interactions with CBD and Optibrium. And the, the first issue had to do with if you click one time, it has to do with the multiple data sources and multiple data types. And how are we going to address that? On the next slide, you'll see that we are very happy to be working so closely with Collaborative Drug Discovery, CDD. And we had worked with Barry Bunin's organization probably about eight, nine years ago as it was just getting started. It's really made great strides in, in, in recent years. And CDD Vault, we felt, uh, offers a lot of advantages for TB Alliance and beyond TB Alliance. So in CDD Vault, what we're capable of doing on the next click, this is now a platform that is available for all of those organizations I just showed you on that previous slide. So our CROs, our big pharma, medium pharma, biotechs, universities, research institutes, by having this um, application, by having this database, we're able to integrate all of those organizations to actually provide direct data upload to a common site, to a common infrastructure database, the CDD vault. More importantly, beyond the TB Alliance's own projects, we are part of a consortium. This is the TB Drug Accelerator, TBDA consortium, which goes beyond just the projects I showed in our own pipeline and involves a lot of different companies and universities. They also have CDD Vault as their mainstay for um, the acquisition and storage of data. And now that allows TV Alliance to work in better coordination with such organizations across this global TV network. And then finally, one of the nice features that we find, and this sort of gets back to Matt's point about data quality and issues as far as uh, variance and reliability, you'll notice in the bottom left corner the TBA sandbox. And what this allows us to do is interrogate data as it comes in from a given organization, assure ourselves that within the context of the assay or the study that was, was being performed, we feel that this is data that is of sufficiently high quality that it can be published. And that's a nice feature that we found with CDD Vault. So we, we use this all the time, and we're very, very pleased that this is getting a lot of great uptake by all of our partners and the TBDA network. So that starts to uh, speak to how we're actually uh, bringing the data together. On the next slide, as I mentioned, CDD Vault gives us an opportunity to manage compound batch registration information, lots and various lots and various different batches, provides all of the uh, all of the infrastructure we need for chemical descriptors, including the structures and some of the properties. I mentioned as well that we now store all of our in vitro and in vivo data, as well as tox data, as well as in a global setting, we want to make sure that the protocols, the assay protocols, are uniform across our various sites. So the biological, pharmacological protocols are also stored uh, in CDD. And finally, from this point of view, um, we're really excited about using CDD visualization. Um, for the users such as myself and other medicinal chemists and the folks that I, I mentioned in the whole consortium, having a simple graphical interface to view the data parameters and trends has been really helpful for us to getting our mind around you know, what a given chemical series is doing and how attractive it might be long term. So that's, that's a bit of a taste of what CDD is allowing TP Alliance to do. 
Now, if we, if we go back to this slide, that's just getting to the issue about how do we manage data, how do we manage both the uh, import of that data and also uh, uh, analysis of the data for data quality. The real question is, how do we analyze this data? And, and Matt made a very important point that we don't want to throw out a chemical series because we believe that it is failing on one property, which may not be the defining property. So how do we actually do this in real time as we are in a, in a highly uh, uh, dispersed uh, area across the globe? And for that, we've turned to star drop, Octivium, uh, Octivium star drop application. On the next slide, these are real world snapshots. I just sort of um, did this in the last uh, couple of days or so and pasted it onto this slide. And try to give you an idea of the sorts of things that we're doing with one chemical series, which is in lead identification space. On the top the graphic, what you see is a depiction of R groups, R1 groups. And as you see here, there are two bars, if you can click on that, which stand out as certainly from the number of compounds that we've interrogated. And very quickly, you can see that the bar, the histogram, the column all the way to the left, well, these compounds have proven with that particular R group to be some of our more potent compounds. Well, the bar in the middle, the red in this case, actually those compounds, in spite of having made a bunch of them, have never actually shown the kind of uh, potency that we're interested in. But remember, I, I mentioned earlier that it's not just about MTB potency. We have to be mindful of off-target toxicities. And in the, in the bottom, we're now looking at a relationship in the box plots of cytotoxicity. And here what you see is the distribution of, in the first case, the first um, oval actually has a very high vero cell cytotoxicity value on, on average, and that would suggest that that substituent is going to be favored rather than the one to its right, where virtually the vast majority of the analogs we made had a low cytotoxicity, so very poor selectivity in our hands. If we go to the next slide, here's where it gets really interesting. So analyzing the data you have is important, and getting a depiction, a graphical depiction of the SAR and trends, be it a physical, chemical, or toxicity trends is important. But really, it gets to what chemistry space should we be moving in? And now if we click through this, what you'll see on this depiction now, the color of these circles is an indication of the MTB potency. So the lighter colored circle all the way to the left, that substituent at the R2 position looks to have improved potency. The larger the circle, the lower the, the, the higher the vero cell cytotoxicity, so the less cytotoxic. And what we want to do is marry those two properties. We want to have potent, non-cytotoxic analogs. And clearly, that space with all the exclamation points is an area that we are moving aggressively into. And these kinds of depictions help us to uh, evaluate multidimensional chemistry space. So we see in Stardrop the ability to do new analog design and synthesis, and it's certainly helping provide guidance along that along that way. I guess I'd finally finish if you click through this. What we see in TD Alliance is the integration of CD, CDD and Stardrop as improving the quality and speed of the missile, missile chemistry decision making across TB Alliance, as well as the larger um, uh, TB drug accelerator, TBDA discovery portfolio. So we're very we're very pleased with this. Chris, that was super helpful. Thank you. Um, I want to. I know we're running out of time, so I just wanted to ask uh, one more question, maybe to both of you. Um, how have technologies evolved to meet the special needs of distributed neglected disease researchers? Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Chris. Sure, Colin. So I think, you know, in my years in the business, and it's been uh, about three decades doing this, it's really been the, Matt talked about data overload, but it's the ability to gather so much information in real time, the advance of, of computers, if you will, and the technology for us, actually communication was raised as one of the poll questions, but being able to communicate that information seamlessly with all of our partners is incredibly valuable. Gathering all that data has also changed radically in the last uh, half dozen or dozen years or so. And now we're faced with the issue of interrogating that data and making informed decisions. Matt?
You might be on mute, Matt. Sure. Yeah, are you there, Matt? <laughs> I am here indeed. I do apologize. Um, I was just Welcome saying, um, I couldn't agree more with what you were saying, Chris. Uh, and I think there's another challenge here, which is, you know, we've already heard about the, 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 the really challenging sort of therapeutic context here. Uh, and unlike, a, I'd say, a big pharma company with lots of resources and money and capabilities, um, you know, not-for-profit organizations and academics can't afford to, so, as you might say, throw the kitchen sink at the problem. Uh, it's very important to choose the best compounds to progress and the right assays to perform to get quickly and efficiently to that, you know, that, that, that candidate and, and ultimately drug. So I think making these critical decisions has become a, a focus of this software um, and uh, something we think is really important in this space. Well, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, let's uh, see what questions we have. Charlie, we must have a few. Yeah, indeed we do. Thanks to all of the attendees who posted questions here. Uh, we'll wrap up and, and take a few minutes here to go through those. So uh, the first question uh, came in specifically for Chris. Uh, how many individual well-validated enzymatic targets are now validated for TB therapy? Great question. Um, the, the short answer is not enough. Uh, the, the slightly longer answer is we're probably only looking at between half a dozen to 10 clinically validated biochemical targets that are, that are important for TB. Now, we have a range of agents coming through, DPRA1 inhibitors. We have ATP synthesis was validated. We have a variety of other MMPL3, which is a membrane target. We have a number of agents which have, or targets rather, which appear to be working in our non-clinical models. But if you just strictly focus on those agents which are, um, you know, have been approved or are in uh, stages of clinical trials, we're only, only looking at maybe 8 to 12 total targets. Thank you. Uh, how many of these are target-oriented, um, uh, really developed using these target-oriented approaches? Um, and in particular, structure-based drug design methods? Again, uh, another great question. Sadly, in, uh, in TB drug discovery, of those, of those 10 or 12 that I just mentioned, really only two um, could possibly, you could possibly say, actually benefited, benefited rather from structure-based drug design. A lot of these targets are membrane-bound targets, and there really has not been um, an effective way to, to develop uh, either do crystal structure work. Uh, there is some work going on in that area, but very few of these compounds have benefited from, um, from from that technique. There's more coming along, and there's a lot of interest going on in, in certain kinase targets, et cetera, uh, but those are not clinically validated targets yet. Excellent. Well, we look forward to that future. So um, another question here, Matt, uh, in your slide uh, earlier showing the probabilistic scoring, uh, how do you get the user-defined profile? Is that simply scientific uh, intuition? Uh, or is it data analysis based on other successful targets or some sort of predictive uh, methodology? That's a, again, an excellent question. So uh, it's a combination. The starting point is the scientist's experience. Uh, very often, you know, an experienced drug discovery scientist, medicinal chemist, and DMPK team, uh, pharmacologists and toxicologists will sit down and have that discussion. They know what they're looking for, essentially, in terms of those sort of ADME properties, obviously activity, selectivity, uh, avoiding uh, toxicity. Uh, and so often you can come up with a, a very good profile just based on the experience of the team. You can encode that, and then everyone can apply that to get the same objective view of the quality of compounds relative to that consensus opinion. But you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes it's not always obvious what are the most important uh, assays to run or what are the, the right, in quotes, criteria to use to choose successful compounds. And we have solutions to that problem as well. We, we've got a, a module we call MPO Explorer, which actually helps to explore existing data using some really unique sort of statistical approaches to help to sort of refine that profile down into you know, the, the, the key properties and the, the right criteria that you can then apply. So it's a combination of uh, computer, uh, but also particularly the experience and, and knowledge of the drug discovery team. Perfect. And uh, we actually had a question on um, uh, the MPO Explorer, so thank you for uh, uh, going in and, and handling that question uh, before I even ask it. I, I like the way that happens. 
Um, one okay. more question. You showed, you showed some large error bars with respect to those molecule scores. Uh, this, of course, is extremely important. Um, how do you deal somehow with the possibly correlated variables uh, when calculating these error bars? Another superb question. And that really comes to the, um, the, the uh, coming up with the most appropriate scoring profile. When you're actually defining that profile that I showed you of, of different criteria, what you don't want to do is to overcount the same effect. Um, and you see that in some of these published examples of, of sort of scoring characteristics is, you know, you count maybe log P, log D, uh, polar surface area, and so on, at which point you know there's a very high correlation between those. So what you're looking for when you're creating one of these scoring profiles is to try to make sure that each, each criteria and each property that you put in there reflects a different risk factor. So although some of those might be correlated anyway, that's a genuine correlation. So you know, if, if you actually do fail both of them, uh, then your chance of success is, is, is dramatically diminished, and so that effect is real. So um, yeah, making sure that you are, you're looking at genuinely independent risk factors is really important to make sure that you're not, uh, you're not overcounting and biasing that decision inappropriately. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I, I know we're uh, uh, over time by a few minutes, but uh, since I can, I'm going to take the liberty and ask my favorite question that came in through the panel. Um, and this is looking towards the future. I'd be very interested, as the attendees would be, um, to get your thoughts on what you see or where you see the next likely breakthrough uh, occurring in TB drug discovery? Is it going to be on the uh, shortening the regiment length uh, side of the spectrum or overcoming the resistance? What What's the next breakthrough in our future going to be for TB drug discovery? Chris, maybe that's for you. Yeah, Charlie. Um, for me, <clears throat> it's going to be treatment shortening. And not to, not to sing our own praises, but uh, TB Alliance has going on right now is something called NIX, NIX, NIX TB trial. I mentioned earlier on about XDR TB. This is looking at novel regimens for XDR TB, the worst of the worst. And you might remember that I said if you have XDR TB, it's, it's basically a death sentence. But you can be put on treatment for up to 30 months. Um, you might respond, you might not. Um, long story short, NIX TB trial is looking at combinations, novel combinations of TB agents. We're seeing activity in the clinic um, where patients are going home at six months. So, so that's a profound, profound difference to go from something with you know, virtually no chance of survival um, to actually seeing patients return home, return to their normal lives, and it's a little over six months. We have hopes to actually, as I said, bring the drug-sensitive TB regimens down to the order of maybe one month. So that's, that's really our, our, our goal. Can we really drive this back and make this a manageable infectious disease? Great. Thank you so much, Chris and Matt, for um, amazing answers to these wonderful questions from our attendees. My pleasure. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Absolutely. And of uh, course, thank you all, uh, our audience, for uh, attending today's session. Uh, we'll post a follow-up on our blog in the next few days. Uh, that'll contain the slides as well as the recording. Um, and so I encourage everyone to please share that post. Uh, you can repost it into your network. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we can alert other people uh, who might be interested. And finally, our next webinar will continue the theme of neglected diseases and will take place on June 28th at 8 o'clock Pacific, 11 Eastern, and other various time zones, of course. And we will welcome panelists Julio Martin from GSK and Mike Palastri from Northeastern University. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.